everybody. Happy noon. Welcome to a special edition of Plugged Into History. It's not Let's Talk Tuesday. It's not Explore More Thursday. Uh, what was it? We were History Unplugged on Fridays? But that was in the evening. That was a cocktail hour. Well, I mean, I guess you could be having a cocktail right now if you're working from home or already off for the day. Anyway, my name is Karen behind the camera. You all remember me. And today we are joining Nicole Thompson, our wonderful historian and seamstress and volunteer coordinator extraordinaire <laughs> for the Beyond the Fields um, program. And Nicole is bringing us a special edition of Plugged Into History today. She's going to be telling us about some history of a pretty important symbol here in the United States. So as always, friends, as you're joining in here, make sure that you put any questions you have in the comments, questions and comments for Nicole. We'll make sure to answer those as they come in. And thanks so much for joining us. It's a beautiful, warm, sunny day here in South Carolina. And uh, we're grateful that you are here with us for Plugged Into History to kick off your July 4th weekend. So take it away, Nicole. Good afternoon and happy Independence Day. Um, I hope that you all will be celebrating um, today and tomorrow. Uh, now, we're gonna talk a little bit about the American flag today. Um, if you drive down any street, if you're here in the United States, you'll see the flag flying in front of businesses or schools. Um, if you walked through a cemetery on Memorial Day, you'd find those flags planted on the graves of sailors and soldiers who fought to defend this nation. Um, if this were a non-pandemic year, tomorrow for the 4th of July parade, you would see hundreds of people, young and old, waving that flag in support of the United States. It has become the symbol of the United States of America. And it certainly has evolved in the 243 years since it was designed. Um, it went from being a simple naval flag to a symbol that is recognized around the world. Now yesterday, um, oh sorry, so today we're going to talk about the history of the flag. We're going to talk about some stories and some myths maybe that surround the flag. And then if time permits, we're going to talk about flag etiquette and some laws that pertain to the flag. Yesterday, I hope you all joined us and were able to view Jeff's presentation about the Declaration of Independence. And as I hope all of you know, that was ratified on July 4th of 1776. That's why we celebrate July 4th the way we do. Now, it's almost a year later, June 14th of 1777, before Congress decides that they need to create uh, a flag for this new nation. And it simply states that resolved that the flag of the United States may be made of 13 stripes, red and white, and that the Union be 13 stars white in a blue field representing a new constellation. Now, that doesn't seem very descriptive to me. However, for most of us, we have no problems envisioning what that looks like. Why? because we've seen it a thousand times in our lifetime. But in 1777, they had no vision. They had no examples to look at like we do today. And so the flag that was created based on that description could have, came, could have come in a variety of forms. And with few existing flags from the 18th century and even few, fewer written descriptions, it's kind of left up to our imagination. Now the Second Flag Act was passed in 1794. It added two stripes and two stars to the existing flag. And those two stripes and two stars were to represent Vermont and Kentucky being added to the Union. The Third uh, Flag Act was passed in 1818. And that act takes the flag back to its original 13 stripes in honor of the original 13 colonies and states that there will be one star represented for each state in the Union. It further goes on to say that those stars will be added or will take effect on the 4th of July immediately following that state's admittance into the Union. So if you were admitted at the end of July, as a state, you had to wait a whole another 11 months before you actually saw that star representing your state on the flag. Oh man. In 1912, 
is when the executive order is finally passed outlining proportions of the flag, how the stripes will be um, designed, and how the stars in that union of blue will also be arranged. Um, 1912, that's a long time between 1777 and 1912. Yeah, that's not so long ago. Yeah. Hey folks, if you're just joining us, don't forget to put your flag questions and all things Independence Day here in the comments. Um, I got the message that there was some light static, so I did mess with my mic a little bit. Let me know if that's any better. If not, I'll just unplug, so thanks for being with us. All right, so 1912, 1912 was the finalization yeah. of the uniformity of the so flag design. You can see that this flag on its early, in the earlier years or the younger years of this country, wasn't the prominent symbol that it is today. Uh, you can see that it took a while. In fact, um, I wanna go back for just a second. When Congress established this in 1777, its primary use, the flag's primary use at that time, was for naval ships and to be flown over forts or garrisons. It wasn't being carried around by ground troops. In fact, most um, troops in the Revolutionary War are carrying their own flag. And it could be anything from a pine tree to a snake to whatever they deem Part was representative of their group. Um, it actually isn't until the early 19th century that we see ground troops start to carry a version of the American flag. So, sorry, I digress a bit. Um, so, no one really knows who specifically designed the first American flag. Um, there is speculation that a man by the name of Francis Hopkinson. Um, he was actually part of the Department of the Navy in 1777. Um, he was a bit of an artist. Uh, he submitted artwork uh, to be used for the Great Seal. Um, and we know that he submitted artwork for the flag because he requests payment for it. Uh, in 1780, he asked Congress, not for money, but he asked them for a keg of federal wine uh, for his <laughs> input on the American flag. Payment and wine, some things don't change. We yes. do actually have a question, Nicole. Sure. Do we know what material was used for early flags? You're gonna cover that, I bet. <laughs> well, actually, I wasn't planning on covering it, but I can tell you, so in the 1770s, um, primarily they would have been using wool. wool. Um, you okay. may have seen some made out of linen, but I would, have, I would think that that would be a little unusual. Now, of course, once we progress into the 19th century, cotton will be, um, fabric of choice. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about a specific flag, um, and if you want, I can talk about the materials that it was made of. Sure. Um, so a lot of people wonder why red, white, and blue, and there's lots of speculation. Does it have something to do with the Union Jack of England? Uh, and the bottom line is, I don't know. I haven't been able to find any research that says specifically why they chose red, white, and blue. Uh, I will tell you that Charles Thompson, who was the Secretary of the Continental Congress um, in the 17, late 1770s, early 1780s, says that white signifies purity and innocence, red, hardiness and valor, valor, valor excuse me, and blue signifies vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Okay. And that is the same for the Great Seal. If you know about the Great Seal, it also has red, white, and blue in it. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about... What's her name? Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross. We have all heard about Betsy Ross. I can't tell you how many times I've been in my shop over the years working on a flag and someone said, oh, are you Betsy Ross? <laughs> um, and because I'm a historian, I always feel the need to tell them that, well, maybe, but not really. So Betsy Ross, we've all heard the story countless times, the idea that Congress developed this group of men and sent them a flag committee, if you will, and sent them to Betsy Ross's shop in Philadelphia and ask this amazing woman to make a flag. Now, unfortunately, that story doesn't actually come to light until 1870. It's almost 100 years after, supposedly, the first flag was sewn. The story is brought to light by a man named William Canby. 
and William Canby is the grandson of Betsy Ross. Now he has no written documentation to support this. Um, he says that it is an oral history, an oral family history, uh, passed down from his mother and his aunts, who had heard it from his grandmother hundreds and hundreds of times. In his paper, he writes a paper for the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and presents it. He doesn't even give a description of the flag, other than to say that the committee wanted to use a six-point star, and Betsy convinced them to use a five-point star. Hmm. Um, so most historians agree that there isn't enough evidence to support the fact that Betsy Ross did sew the first flag, but most would agree that there's not enough evidence that says she did it. Um, but this story has been told so many times over and over and over that there's a good chance that your actual history book in high school actually contained the name of Betsy Ross and told you that Betsy Ross sewed the first flag. The other thing is, is the image. Now, when we think of Betsy Ross's flag, we think of this. We think of this visual the stars in the circle. Some stories have gone so far as to say that this was George Washington's idea, that that way no star or no state was greater than the other. We have nothing, no evidence, no written documentation to support that um, at all, although it does sound nice. In fact, this illustration, this version of this flag, doesn't actually appear until 1892. Hmm. A gentleman paints a version of this. In fact, the same gentleman that buys the Betsy Ross house. And he begins basically selling this version of the flag as the original version of the American flag. But again, we've seen this so many times. If I ask any of you and I showed you this flag, you'd say, oh, that's the Betsy Ross flag. Right. Now there is an image of um, a linked chain, a circular linked chain, and each link in the chain is representative of one of those original colonies. So I kind of wonder if this idea to arrange the stars this way, whoever came up with that, had seen that contemporary image of the linked and, chains. And there's lots of documentation that because earlier when I said in 1777 the stars were to represent a new constellation, uh, there's lots of images, and again, they're from the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, where the stars are in a box with a large square in the center. Uh, that's also, yesterday Jeff talked about Trumbull, um, in some of Trumbull's paintings depicting battles from the Revolutionary War. That is the image that he uses. Uh, keep in mind that one of the battles that Trumbull depicts uh, was fought six months before the Flag Act was ever passed. So, <laughs> you know, artists sometimes take liberties with Well, things. and we know Trumbull sure did. Right. Um, another in the 1800s, particularly after the War of 1812, um, one of the designs that we find quite often is these stars placed uh, to form a bigger star, a greater star. And, and that's actually very popular um, from the early 19th century all the way through till probably the probably the third quarter of the 19th century. Um, but this is what we all know. This is Betsy at her very finest. <laughs> um, so the next flag I want to talk to you about is, some, is a flag that most Americans are probably a little less familiar with. You'll remember that I said in 1794, Congress passed the second flag act, and that was 15 stars and 15 stripes. Um, well, in 1814, um, in Fort McHenry, that's in Baltimore, Maryland, for any of you that are um, wondering, um, the head of the garrison there went to a flag maker in Baltimore named Mary Pickersgill. She was a famous flag maker in Baltimore. Um, Baltimore is a seafaring city, and so she was making flags for ships. And she was commissioned to create a great garrison flag. This thing is humongous. Um, to fly over Fort McHenry. Now, she was given a very short timeline, and it is a very large flag. And so, according to the Smithsonian, and according to the National Park Service, she was assisted by her elderly mother, 
her daughter, her two nieces, and an indentured African-American girl named Grace Wisher. Now, the National Park Service also says that according to the census at that time, Mary Pickersgill also owned a female slave. They do not know her name. It has been lost to history, but it is very easy for us to imagine that she too was brought in to assist in the making of this flag. Well, sure. I mean, if y'all know about the Star Spangled Banner at Fort McHenry, I grew up right outside of Fort McHenry, so I know that Star Spangled Banner. That is a massive, massive textile. And so this would be a great time, Nicole, to explain sort of the difference between indentured servitude and enslaved servitude, because um, it's actually kind of rare that we hear about an indentured African-American. Usually African-Americans were enslaved and, and indentured servitude um, was, you know, different, different classes of, of white people. Right. So to hear about an indentured uh, African-American is interesting and, and tells us something about her family. And, and it is unusual. Um particularly because Maryland is a slave-holding state yeah. in 1814, and it, it, um, and it is unusual. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of research into it. What I can tell you is that um, she was free. Um, her family was unable to care for her, um, and so she was put into indentured servitude to Mary Pickersgill to learn a skill. Um, and so indentured servitude usually has a specific time frame associated with it, usually somewhere between three and seven years. Um, we often think of um, indentured servitude as a way of paying off debt. Uh, when we talk about indentured servants coming from Europe, their debts were often purchased, and so they were um, indentured to, a certain, to the person who paid off their debt for a specific amount of time. In this particular case, they call it indentured servitude, but in my mind, it seems more like an apprenticeship. Um, but the Smithsonian calls it indentured servitude, and so does NPS, and so that's what we will talk about. Now, the enslaved woman that um, is also in the Pickersgill household um, is mentioned, they believe, to be a cook. Um, and so, of course, we know that that is chattel slavery, and that is never ending, and she will remain in that position until her death or until... Uh, someone purchases her freedom for her. Interesting. So that's an incredible, uh, incredible piece of history to see all of these different statuses in the same household and, and to know that Grace's family was free and that they were, um, you know, that's how indentured servitude in terms of not paying off debts, like Nicole said, was used as a matter of uh, a way to teach um teach people skills so that when the indenture was over they could then make make a life for themselves and and figure out a way um to move forward as a free person so and unfortunately none of my research has given any indication to what happened to grace um mm. after her indentured servitude with mary interesting um, karen kind of mentioned it but i want to make sure that everyone understands that this flag that we're talking about that was flying over fort mchenry during the battle of baltimore in 1814 um, was the inspiration for francis scott key to write the star spangled banner when he awoke in the morning after the battle and saw the torn and battered down flag it inspired him uh, to write that particular song um, that particular flag actually is on exhibit in the Smithsonian Museum of American History and has been since the 1960s. Is it there? It was It was actually at Fort McHenry for a minute. Yeah, well, it's and the Smithsonian. It came back to the Smithsonian. It yeah. Out. yeah. Um, it's also um, important to note that we know the Star Spangled Banner sorry, yeah, sorry. as <laughs> our national anthem, but that didn't actually take effect until 1931. So in 1923, uh, executive order said that we were going to have a national anthem, but in 1931 is when they decided that the Star Spangled Banner would actually be that anthem. It took them eight years to figure it out. It takes yeah. them a long time to figure <laughs> out stuff with this flag. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you've uh, noticed that. So we have a question, and I think sure. it's probably going to lead nicely into where you were going next. And the question is, were flags sewn together in pieces or were they woven? 
So they were sewn. Oh, let me, you ask about fabric, and I told you I was going to talk about the fabrics, um, and that was specifically about the Fort McHenry flag. Uh, because we have this flag, we're able to study it, I can tell you that the flag is made of wool. The red and white stripes are, and the blue union is made of wool, but the stars are made from cotton fabric. Hmm. Yeah is kind of interesting. So no, they're sewn together. Uh, they are simply taking pieces of fabric um, and sewing them together. Now keep in mind that up until the 20th century, uh, flags are one-sided. So if you look at my flag, this is the right side, this is the wrong side. I have to look at my stitches. No, come on, we want to <clears throat> look at your stitches, y'all. You got to understand, Nicole hand sewed this flag and she would never like brag about that so I'm going to. <laughs> but in Nicole modern, is an amazing seamstress. Okay, there we go. But in modern times, our flags are double-sided. So that allows you to fl fly your flag this way or properly this way without seeing the back side of it. So um, it's important to note that that's a, that's a modern day type of thing. So if there's no more questions or if I answered that question, I want to talk about flag etiquette. That seems to, you know, everyone has bits and pieces or ideas about what it is you can and cannot do with the American flag. So in 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt approves the federal flag code. Now it's important that you hear this. These are guidelines about how the American flag is to be treated. It imposes no penalties. So these are guidelines and most people respect them, but if you decide not to, you can't go to prison for it, you can't get a ticket for it, um, there are no penalties imposed. Now, some of these include not just disrespecting the flag, it should be shown um, um, admiration, the flag of the United States of America, it should never be dipped to any person or anything. So it should never be lowered to anyone, like a foreign power. Um, it should never be displayed with the Union facing down. If you're ever in dire distress of losing your life or property, particularly those of you that go out on boats, if you hang your flag upside down, that is a signal of distress. But other than that, it should never be flown that way. It should never touch anything beneath it, the ground, the floor, the water. Um, it should never be used as wearing apparel or costumes or uh, sports uniforms. Karen mentioned earlier to me outside, <laughs> paper plates, napkins, hats, swim trunks, underwear, um, all those things that we seem to use to celebrate the 4th of July, according to the flag code, we really shouldn't be doing. Now, I know many of you are wondering well, is it ever against the law to burn or to deface the flag or to rip it up? And I will tell you that in 1968, there was a Flag Protection Act passed. It was actually passed as a direct result of flags being burned at demonstrations protesting the Vietnam War. And it stayed in effect until 1989. 1989 the Supreme Court said that that was unconstitutional and so the Flag Protection Act was actually amended but less than a year later um, the, um, the Supreme Court came back and again said no the Flag Protection Act is unconstitutional and I want to read you what it says so in 1990 the Supreme Court case of the United States versus Eichmann struck down the Flag Protection Act, ruling again that the government's interest in preserving the flag as a symbol does not outweigh an individual's First Amendment right to disparage the symbol through expressive conduct. So in other words, it is, it is your First Amendment right to burn that flag should you desire to do so. So I think it's important that we remember that. Absolutely. Um, the last thing that I want to say, and I wrote this down because I want to make sure that it is expressed exactly the way that I wrote it. These three simple pieces of fabric, the red, 
red, white, and blue cotton. They don't mean anything by themselves. They're just pretty fabric, nice to look at. Well, we can make a flag out of them. It's just a few stripes and a few stars. And yet, when they're combined together to create this American flag, these three simple pieces of fabric evoke a magnitude of emotions among people. Pride, fear, honor, despair. It means many things. The paper's just gonna blow away. It means many things to many different people all over the world. But regardless of what it means to you or to me or to anyone else, there is no denying that the stars and stripes of the American flag has become the most prominent symbol in these United States of America. Absolutely. Thank you. I hope I gave you something to think about or to learn about today. Um, and again, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. And again, happy 4th of July. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was so awesome. We really appreciate it. There is definitely a ton of information that you've given us to consider today and uh, I hope that everybody goes into their fourth holiday this weekend much better informed and uh, much more thoughtful as they display their American flags um, or as they see the display of the American flag. So folks, thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Plugged Into History. It is my duty to remind you that um, these programs are free and accessible on the internet here on Facebook and on our website and our YouTube channel. And we so appreciate you joining with us and um, engaging with us today and supporting the Plugged Into History digital portal. And uh, as you find yourself able, if you are able, we would love for you to go to middletonplace.com slash donate. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that we have that $25,000 match going on right now. A generous donor has offered a match. Um, so if you are able and uh, inclined, we would love for you to uh, make a special donation here for the fourth uh, to Middleton Places um, Plugged Into History. Can and I say one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. And if you're willing and you're able, come visit us. We have lots and lots of more history that we would love to share with you. And lots and lots more space. Yes. Look, look at all this space that you can come and socially distance. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Nicole. We will definitely see you again. Uh, thank you for the wonderful information. Everybody have a happy 4th of July. Bye. Bye.